Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. This is Adam Hilton with ECS, and we're getting ready to start our webinar on ice plug prevention for cold storage applications. Uh, before we get started, a couple housekeeping items. Um, due to the number of attendees, we're going to keep everyone on mute. If you have a question, please feel free to submit it through the question uh, portal on the GoToWebinar functionality. We'll be answering all questions at the end of the seminar. For those of you who have to drop off before we get to questions, we'll be capturing the questions and answers and distributing that to the list of registry, regist registered attendees. Uh, we're planning on a presenting for pretty much the full 30 minutes. We've got a lot of material to cover. And with that being said, we're going to go ahead and jump in. So a little bit about who we are, quickly for those of you who don't know us. At ECS, we're a team of multidisciplined engineers. We've got fire protection, mechanical, metallurgical, chemical, and electrical engineers on staff. We have a certified chemist. We have licensed fire protection and mechanical engineers. And kind of the technology innovators in this field, we've got 22 patents issued currently with several other applications being processed. apologize for that. We seem to be lagging going from slide to slide here, but what we're going to cover today is industry guidelines. So it's important to know what's telling us what we have to do, how we have to test, how we have to design, and how we have to maintain these systems. So we're going to cover NFPA 13, we're going to cover NFPA 25, and then the FM data sheet A-29, which deals with refrigerated storage. We're going to touch on the current technologies that are available for these refrigerated areas, which would be our dry air pack or regenerative desiccant dryers, nitrogen-based systems, and the newcomer to the field, which is vacuum-based systems, uh, VacTech by Fireflex, for those of you who have or, or have not seen that. And then kind of what will fall out of the presentation is what are best practices in this segment of our industry and how can we make sure that we're meeting the requirements and getting the best process that we can. All right, so why, why are we here? Field examinations of existing freezers have shown ice plugs in over 50% exam of the freezers that are examined. And that's straight out of our FM property loss prevention data sheet 8-29. So what we can kind of garner is, is an industry, what we've done so far and what we're doing it is not producing the results that we're intending it to produce. So whether that's the systems that we're using, the processes that we're using or the maintenance procedures, we're not getting the ice-free pipe networks that we're aiming for. And that just as a general side note, as you see throughout the presentation, that little eye inside the green circle, that's gonna be little, little information pieces that uh, aren't necessarily directly out of a standard. They're kind of observations or best practices uh, that we've come across. So with our first piece of information there, ice plugs were generally found within the first 15 feet of the pipe inside the cold storage environment or envelope. And that's because as that moisture laden air is entering that colder environment, the moisture is just dropping out and then freezing against the pipe wall where it's, where it's coming in contact with the pipe. Trying to find a way here to speed up the slide to slide, but I don't I don't know if it's the number of attendees we have on the presentation or or what's going on with the server here. But bear with us, we'll get through this. All 
All right, so starting with, with our first standard that we're gonna look at today is NFPA 13. So most, most of the attendees here are probably familiar with it. For those of you that aren't, this is our standard for installation of fire sprinkler systems. It's gonna tell us what we have to do as far as design requirements and how we have to install. So when we first start looking at sections of NFPA 13 that pertain to the cold storage environment, we have to understand like, what are we defining within 13 as a cold storage environment? So when we talk about spaces that are maintained uh, above 32 degrees, uh, there is a special section, and then there's a special section for spaces that are maintained below 32 degrees. Obviously that critical temperature is where our liquid water turns to ice and becomes an obstruction for us. Uh, we're speeding up now. All right, so when we start looking at the section that pertains to cold storage environments that are, are below 32 degrees Fahrenheit or below freezing, NFPA 13 gives us three options of where we can, what we can do for supervisory gas. So we can use an air compressor and draw air from the room of lowest temperature within the cold storage envelope to draw, draw that dry air where the moisture has already been driven out of it and compress that, put it back into the system. We can use an air compressor or dryer package that's actually listed as some sort of dehydrator or moisture removing package, or we can use compressed nitrogen gas from cylinders in lieu of compressed air. So just as a note, you'll see the little yellow triangle on the presentation slide there. Just because we take air from the coldest room and then compress it does not guarantee moisture free air. And that's actually language that's out of the NFPA 13 handbook. And we'll also see it revisited again in the 8-29 FM data sheet. So suffice it to say, while it is an allowable option, it's not necessarily the best practice to take an air compressor and just source your air from the, from the freezer environment and put it directly into your system. You will see ice buildup and ice blockages if, if that is your method of, of sourcing your compressed air. So the handbook in, in FPA 13 goes on to tell you that for the best, a best practice or a higher degree of preventing formation of ice blocks is if we reduce the dew point of the gas that's going into our system to be no more than 20 or uh, so the, the gas entering is 20 degrees below the lowest nominal temperature in the freezer environment for which the fire protection systems are protecting or installed. Uh, that again is something that we're going to see revisited in 8-29 when we get to it. So as we progress through the standard, we'll actually get into some piping configurations here for NFPA 13, which showing you how they want you to pipe the source air when it's uh, going into the, the freezer environment. So again, for those environments that are below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And what this graphic is showing us is when we take the air, so in this graphic, it's actually taking the source air for the compressor to go from the, from the freezer environment. It's compressing it, but then as you notice that second larger red circle, we've got two air supply lines that are going into the system, all right? And, and there's a reason for that. And why NFPA 13 is telling us to do that is they want these redundant lines, they want them to be independent, independently valved, and they want them arranged such that at any given time, one of those two lines is valved off. And the reason behind that is that way you can go in, if you do have an ice plug, you can valve off the plugged line, open up your bypass line or your secondary line, and then clear the obstruction from your primary air delivery line. The other reason they have you routing it through the freezer is as soon as that, from, from the previous slide, we know that as soon as that moist air gets into that cold environment, the moisture is going to drop out and we're going to form our ice plug. So by doing this, the idea is we're gonna drop the moisture out in these redundant air supply lines before, if you notice, it routes back out of the freezer and into our, into our fire protection system. So it's kind of like an added protection. If we are still having moisture that's gonna drop out in our supply or supervisory gas, we're gonna drop it out in one of these two redundant legs where we can deal with it much easier and it won't be impeding the water flow into the system. So, Another little piece of information that we can see on this slide is for those valves that do require priming water, it is, 
it does happen where that priming water will migrate up and create an ice plug, evaporate up and create an ice plug where the where the feed pipe f enters into the freezer environment. So that's something to be aware of. There are there actually are some precautions to take if you're using a valve that requires priming water. One of them is inserting a check valve with a 332nd inch orifice above the clapper, which will reduce the migration of that water. Moving on, just as a general point of information, the more your compressor runs or the more your supervisory gas source runs, the more potential you have to be introducing moisture into that system, the faster you're gonna see ice plugs or ice buildup develop. So let's take a look at NFPA 13. And when we're talking about supervisory gas, what is NFPA 13 telling us what we can and can't do? So if we start off at the top of the slide, we're gonna kind of migrate down through it. And so the first thing NFPA 13 is going to tell us is anywhere they use air within the term air within the standard, that they also mean that you can use nitrogen or another improved gas. So then as we move down, we know that when we're sizing our air supply for these drier pre-action systems, we have to be capable of reaching our operating pressure within 30 minutes. OK, so that's standard. That's that's even outside of a freezer environment. So that's nothing special special to a freezer environment, but it does apply. So then we move further down the slide where we're using nitrogen or another approved gas, the supply shall be from a reliable source. If we look to the appendix to kind of elaborate on that for us, we'll notice that they tell us nitrogen can be, or the other approved gas can be either generated on site or from storage containers such as a nitrogen cylinder. So what we wanted to show here is, is how you can get through the standard and how nitrogen generators are applicable in this instance and allowable. Another general point of information, and, and we kind of find as we talk with people, that some, some people are unaware of this point, uh, section 7.2633 in the standard. And what that tells us is if we are in a, a freezer environment where we're maintaining a temperature below five degrees Fahrenheit, we take that 30 minute requirement to get to supervisory pressure and we actually expand it to 60 minutes. So we did want to point that out for those that are working in or operating in environments where we're below five degrees Fahrenheit. We do take that 30 minute requirement to get to supervisory pressure and expand it to 60 minutes. So that affects the size of either the, the air dryers or the nitrogen generator that you're putting in. So that pretty much sums up what we want to look at in NFPA 13 as it pertains to refrigerated systems. So now we want to move on to NFPA 25. And so for those that aren't as familiar with NFPA 13 and 25, where 13 is telling us how we have to design and install the system, 25 is going to tell us how we have to inspect, test, and maintain our system. So as we migrate from we have an installed system, it's been accepted, and now we're in an operating facility, what do we move on to do to ensure that our system is one, maintain compliance with the standard, but two, really operating in an, in an optimal condition. So when we start looking at what kind of inspections that we need to do on these freezer systems, we wanna see that we have to just visually inspect the system. But what we wanna point out here on number five, of section 52111 is that we're looking for what they term loading detrimental to sprinkler performance. In the freezer environment, what we're really looking for, is there any ice buildup on the sprinkler that is going to impede the functionality or the performance or the spray pattern development, basically make that sprinkler perform undesirably or not as intended. So that's important for us again in the freezer environment because we're gonna, we're gonna have this added obstruction or added loading um, that, that a non-freezing environment wouldn't have, which would be the ice buildup. A general point of information, um, again, for those who have glass bulbs in their freezer environment, if that glass bulb color, your, your temperature rating color has faded or changed, that doesn't mean that the sprinkler needs to be replaced. So the testing has been done that shows that in some freezing environments, some of these glass bulbs, the color will change. But the testing shows that it does not affect the operation of the sprinkler and the sprinkler can remain in service. So again, maybe a section of the standard that people are not familiar with, but we thought it important to go ahead and point out. As we move in uh, deeper into the 25 standard, we're going to look at the refrigerated spaces and areas within the building interior where temperatures are maintained at or below 40 degrees. 
they're not permitted to be left wet. You know, maybe that seems like an obvious obvious point to, to those of us who operate in these environments, but they do have it in the standard there. So any temperature below 40 degrees, we can't leave these systems wet. So if you just had a cool storage environment, even though it's not freezing, we can't leave water in those systems. Moving through the standard, air dryers that are maintained shall be maintained in accordance with manufacturer's instructions. Again, expected, we do expect to have to maintain this equipment the standards just going ahead and saying yes, we, if we don't cover it in here, if it's not covered in NFPA 25 specific maintenance procedures, go ahead and consult your manufacturer's operation or maintenance manual to see what you need to be doing, what you need to be testing, and what your replacement parts are through the life cycle of the piece of equipment. And then again, compressors used in conjunction with dry pipe sprinkler systems shall be inspected as per chapter 13, which would be a compressor inspection that you would have to do for any dryer pre-action system. For those of you familiar with the standard, you will notice the chart there towards the bottom of the slide. NFPA 25 has excellent resources within it to show you really break down what considered, what's considered an impairment, what, uh, what frequency we have to be testing these things. So that's really too much information for us to cover in the presentation today. But know that that's the resource. If you have any specific questions, feel free to reach out to us. We're definitely happy to answer them. So. Moving on to chapter 13 of NFPA 25, we're going to talk about pre-action and dry pipe valves. So the first two sections of the standard there that are cited on the top of this slide are telling us that when we trip test these systems, so when we're doing our required trip test, we're, we're making sure our valves releasing as, as required, we don't want to introduce any moisture into the piping in the freezers. So when you look back through some of those installation diagrams and when we get into the data sheet 8-29 from FM, what you're going to see is a recommendation is to put an indicating valve on the top of the riser or above your dryer pre-action valve such that you can close it and trip your valve against it. That way we can verify the functionality of your dryer pre-action valve, but we're not putting water or moisture into the pipe network that we're going to have to go chase down, get out, and let's be honest, we all know for those of us who operate and open these systems up, trying to get water out of a system that's that's been hydrostatically tested or trip tested it is a very very hard endeavor uh, to to do so the last section on here on this slide is an interesting section and it's definitely a best practice and that is putting a an, an, a gauge an air gauge on two air gauges on your dry pipe or pre-action air supply system and what we want that to do is, is if we remember our previous slide where we take our air supply piping, run it into the cold envelope, and then run it back out. We want to gauge on, on both sides of that, so before it enters and then after it enters. And what that allows you to do is a quick visual check to see if you have some sort of obstruction in that airline. So if you were to take those two gauges and look at the gauge that's on the airline between the compressor and where the airline enters the cold storage environment, and that pressure were to be higher, say, than the gauge that is on uh, where, the, where the piping exits the cold storage environment or the cold envelope, then that would be an indicator that you have an ice bug or some sort of ice buildup impeding the flow of, of supervisory gas into your system and let you know that you need to go pull one of those spools of pipe out, put your secondary air supply line in service while you clear the ice blockage and then return the return that line to service. So moving on to the next slide, we're going to talk about the specific section in an FPA 25 that deals with ice obstruction. So that's that's section 14.4. Um, being told that the slides are cut off for some of you and I'm not sure where or how. So again, we can we can make the slide deck available after the presentation. We'll try to deal with that as we move through. Uh, but my apologies if some of you are, aren't able to see the entirety of the slide. So, so back to section 14.4. So what that's telling us is ice obstructions, as an industry, we know they happen. The standard knows they occur. So what do we need to do about them? It's telling us we need to, in environments that are maintained below freezing, we need to inspect internally on an annual basis. So that means opening up the system, 
the places we're going to want to be looking is definitely right as the the water or the sprinkler piping enters into the cold envelope because again from the previous slide we know that these the ice buildups typically are forming that are forming from from the supervisory gas that's moving into the system are forming within 10 to 15 feet of in the pipe entering into the cold storage environment now other places we probably want to look are any dip, any any water traps in the pipe any drops in the pipe uh like in rack systems things like that where if water was to enter the system say in a trip event that didn't get cleared out or or didn't get cleared out before it froze up um th those are the areas we want to look but it's interesting to note the blue text that we have on the slide here the handbook goes on to say that they change the wording a little bit and, and they're telling us that these ice obstructions should be conducted regularly and so you see that the, the term regularly replacing annually so again annually is what the 25 standard is going to require best practice might be to look semi-annually or even quarterly in key areas just to make sure you're not getting an ice buildup and then again in that 14.4 ice obstruction section they're telling you to look in the penetrations and uh, um, if if you do find the ice obstruction then additional pipes shall be examined to ensure that you don't have a larger problem uh, that's more pervasive throughout the pipe network so moving to the next slide picking up a little delay All right, so moving on to the FM 8-29 data sheet. Now this is gonna only apply typically to your FM underwritten properties. There are other entities out there that choose to follow FM guidelines and data sheets in certain areas. So we thought it important to go ahead and cover that in this presentation. And so what FM 8-29 has to say, and it is the standard specifically for refrigerated storage, is that they want you to use a dehydrator or a dehydration source dehydrator or regenerative air dryer or fm approved dry air unit as your source for compressed air so what that boils down to is basically the technologies that we're going to be looking at a little bit later in the presentation which is either a, a regenerative desiccant dryer or uh, actually a nitrogen generator would be considered a dehydrator so because we're pulling the moisture out of the gas dry pipe systems need to be pressurized as described in their data sheet 2-0 which is again their standard just for for water-based fire protection systems and pre-action systems we want again the same thing as the dry pipe systems we want to bring the air through a through an adequately sized dehydrator so this is the graphic that I was alluding to earlier where you see the big red circle. That is your indicating valve that we, you, blocking valve, trip valve, what, whatever you call it, then call it different things in different parts of the country. But where that valve comes in is when you're getting ready to trip, test your dryer pre-action valve, you wanna go ahead and close that. And that way your water can't make it into the cold environment where it'd have to be drained or potentially ice plugs would have to be cleared out. So. FM is going to tell you the same thing that the best practice of NFPA 13 is going to tell you, which is you want a dew point of 20 degrees below the lowest nominal temperature where the fire protection systems are serving. Again, that's a best practice. They're going to tell you they want you to take the air from the freezer with the lowest temperature, and they want you to feed the compressed air through duplex lines like what we were seeing in our earlier standard NFPA 13. And then the last bullet point is the check valve or the blocking valve that we talked about previously. After a trip event, 8-29 actually has a specific section to tell you what to do after a trip, trip event. So once we've introduced water into the cold storage environment, we're gonna inspect each branch line and cross main. If we find ice plugs, they want you to go ahead and disassemble, disassemble the entire system, move it to a warm area and make sure we're thawing everything out. What they do not want you to do under any circumstances is to use electric welding machines, an open flame device, or even a resistance heater to thaw that pipe out because of the ignition source that it presents. So there is a section for those of you who wanna go look through 829 where they talk about some contractors have used steam or hot water to thaw systems out in place. Uh, I've never been a part of a project that's done that. I don't know if anyone on here has, 
Um, but I'm, I, I don't know, for me, that seems like a risky proposition, but it is addressed in 8-29. So with that being said, we've covered all the standards that are gonna apply to us in this environment. So let's move on to the technologies that are available. So we're gonna start out with a dry air pack, which is a regenerative desiccant dryer. It's probably the most used source gas uh, uh, provider of, of supervisory source gas in, in the cold storage environment. It's very common to see these installed. Um, when we're talking about specifically the dry air pack, they're going to tell you in their O&M and installation manual that we want to limit three systems per dry air pack. Uh, we know we wouldn't be here doing this uh, uh, if, they, if there wasn't some opportunity for ice accumulation to be built up when using these dry air packs, whether that be through insulation or sizing or maintenance not being done on them. But the fact of the matter is in applications where these are being used, and we'll go through some case studies here in a second, there, there is ice buildup and ice plugging possible. And with this particular technology referencing their data sheet, an operating dew point of negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit is the, is the dew point or the lowest dew point that this piece of equipment is going to be capable of, of providing. So now that we're a little familiar with that technology, let's talk about the initial setup, operation, and maintenance of the dry air pack. Uh, they're going to want you, when you install it or replace a desiccant, we, they want you to run that dryer for eight hours to break that desiccant in before we start putting air into our system. And then they want you to change the compressor oil after we break that desiccant in or after that initial eight hour run um, after, um, upon installation. When we operate the system, we want to adjust that such that the dryer does not run for more than 40 minutes per hour. And we also want to adjust the, the dryer such that it runs no more than four times per hour. When you initially put a system, a fire sprinkler system in service that's being supplied by a dryer pack, they want you to open an inspection test point such that for 24 hours, you can purge air through that system. Again, following the no more than 40 minutes per hour and no more than four times per hour guidelines uh, that they have set up for you. As far as maintenance, they want you to change the desiccant every one to two years. Again, once you change the desiccant, you're going to need to run the dryer for eight hours prior to putting air into the sprinkler system. For the first two hours of that break-in period, they want you to remove the mufflers, and then after that, you can replace them back on the system. So we've got to touch on corrosion because that's who we are. It's in our DNA, and we wanted to break this down for you, and we're going to do it for every technology. When we talk about the dry air pack, and the red text at the top of the slide, assuming the oxygen is a rate limiting component of the corrosion reaction, which we, which we know is true, there's always gonna be moisture in the system. And when we're talking about freezer environments, we're only talking about these environments, those environments that are above 32 degrees because below 32 degrees, you don't have oxygen corrosion because you have no liquid water, it's all ice. So we're talking about those sections of pipe that are in non-freezing environments or outside the cold envelope, depending on how your system's laid out, you might have ganged risers that run in an unconditioned space before they penetrate the freezer. So basically what this slide is showing us right here is even though we're pulling moisture out of the air with our dry air pack or our desiccant regenerative desiccant dryer, we're still putting compressed atmosphere, which is 21% oxygen into the system. So we're not reducing the amount of oxygen molecules. So the left side of the slide is dry air pack. The right side of the slide is what we're doing with a nitrogen generator system with 98% nitrogen. And essentially boiling all that down, you have 950% more corrosion with a regenerative desiccant dryer than you would if you were serving with a nitrogen system. So moving on to nitrogen technology, which is probably the up and coming technology. It's, it's the second most used technology uh, outside of just air comp compressed air for these cold storage environments. Uh, the reason that nitrogen came into the industry is because we were controlling corrosion just in general in dry and pre-action systems, and now we've realized that it's an excellent fit for, for refrigerated or freezer environments. And the reason is that chart on the left-hand side of the slide. What that shows us is the higher purity nitrogen we're producing, the lower the dew point. So when we're producing 98% nitrogen, we're producing a, a gas that has a dew point of negative 100, 100 degrees Fahrenheit which is well below any of the cold storage operations that we're gonna see. Again, looking at the same three characteristics, we can serve up to 22 1,000 gallon systems with a nitrogen generator. So instead of three, we can serve up to 22, reduce the amount of equipment necessary. 
we're, there will be no ice accumulation because at 98% nitrogen, we're negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit dew point. So uh, the cooler will not be getting that cold and there's no opportunity for moisture to drop out. On this initial setup operation and maintenance of a nitrogen generator, connect electrical service, plumb the air compressor to the generator, plumb the generator to however many valves you want to be serving and set your operating pressure. These are all things that had to be done with the regenerative desiccant dryers. Um, but whereas with the desiccant dryers, you have break-in period and all that, there's nothing like that with the gener nitrogen generator. You just hook it up and let it go. Uh, as far as operation, we do have a vent. So similar to what we were doing with the desiccant dryer, where we were opening the system for 24 hours and then going back and closing it. With a nitrogen generator, we're going to have a vent, but it's going to be right on the riser in the valve room. There's two options, a manual vent that you can open and then come back and close after 14 days after putting the system, the sprinkler system in service. Or we do have a sm what we call a smart vent that automatically closes. So when your fitter is out there and sets the valve up, puts the system, sprinkler system in service, you initiate the vent and it automatically closes itself. As far as maintenance, what we have for maintenance on the nitrogen generator is we have a set of filters that need to be changed annually. They're cartridge to base. Maintenance takes about 30 minutes once you're in and in front of the generator to take those filters out and put them back in. And then the air compressor, we use the air compressors we use that are oiled, recommend a fi every 500 hours change the oil in them. Just a quick overview of what nitrogen looks like is a continuous source of nitrogen, the oxygen removal vent at the riser, and then some method to get the oxygen or the oxygen purged out of the system and the nitrogen in. And that's our fill and purge method. That's our, our, our pressure fluctuation within the system. Um, going through the nitrogen technology that's on the market right now, there's two distinct options. There's the fill and purge method is what we offer. And there's a constant pressure sweep method is, which is what all of the providers offer. This slide kind of shows you the constant sweep method, which is all other providers on the market. And the important thing for the freezer, freezer operations is the vent on a constant sweep nitrogen generation system is going to be on the end of the system or in the cold environment. And that picture to the left, for those of you who can see it, is showing a vent that was in a freezer environment that actually cracked because there was water that got trapped in it and it created a trip event. So with with the with what we do, the fill and purge method, which is cycles the pressure, cycles the nitrogen in and out of the system through varying the, the pressure, operating pressure of the system by one to three PSI, we're able to put that vent in the condition space back where the valve is, and we don't have to worry about accessing, freezing that vent or accessing it in the cold storage environment for any type of maintenance procedure. We wanted to show you again, there are there are multiple providers of nitrogen generators uh, for the fire protection industry. All those that you see on your screen right now are all FM approved. There are other options out there. Uh, some of them are not FM approved. I do caution you to make sure you know what you're buying and ask that question. Um, really the big difference in, in the providers that are out there uh, is the amount of equipment it takes to accomplish the same job. So whether you need a nitrogen storage tank or refrigerated air dryer, where your vents located, things like that. Um, again, we're just covering this at a high level today. Any questions that anyone has, please feel free to contact us. We're more than happy to answer them. Of course, uh, other providers can answer questions as well. So that brings us to the newest technology. Um, I don't know how familiar many of you are with vacuum systems. Fireflex has introduced a package called VacTech. It operates on the principle of creating a vacuum inside of the pipe network instead of a positive pressure environment to supervise the integrity of the piping system. Um, some, the same three key points that we want to look at that we looked at with the previous technologies are one unit per system. So you have a vac, Fireflex VacTech unit for every single system. Inside that cabinet, you're going to have a valve. You're going to have all your trim work in the, in the vacuum unit along with its controller. We think, although we don't have a wide base uh, of empirical field installations to draw on, we don't think ice buildups are likely with these systems simply because uh, it's running a vacuum instead of a positive pressure, pressure environment. And the air that will ingress into the system is going to be coming from the freezer. 
and your dew point will be slightly below the freezer dew point because we're drawing gas from the freezer and then putting a vacuum on it or lowering the pressure, which would lower the dew point. Again, initial setup operation and maintenance we want to look at with this technology. We're going to set the cabinet. It is a prepackaged solution. So connect electrical service, connect water supply inlet, water discharge outlet, and then any of your electrical de detection connections that you need to make. Set your operating pressure. Operation, you just activate your control system. It's all integral to the cabinet. As far as maintenance, it's unclear. I actually attended their presentation at this uh, past year's NFPA Expo. Good presentation. There's just not a lot of information out available right now. Um, so we don't really know what the maintenance looks like. You can definitely contact Fireflex. I'm sure they will be happy to explain that to you. One of the things we do know about the vacuum system, though, is you do need to have a listed sprinkler that's listed to operate with a vacuum environment. It is a special sprinkler. So those of you looking at retrofit considerations, there are only a limited number of sprinklers that are listed right now, so only certain K factors. They are approving more sprinklers as we speak, so we do expect that selection to widen. But if you're retrofitting, you're going to have to look at hydraulic calculations, how those are affected if we have to change our K factor, potentially inducing a fire pump. If you have NRAC sprinklers, you're going to have to look at listings and make sure you're listed appropriately, uh, or there is a sprinkler that's listed appropriately for NRAC with that vacuum environment. And then if you have existing valves, of course, you're going to replace those valves with this VACTEC technology. Um, again, this is just kind of a look from the corrosion standpoint. It's very similar to the desiccant dryer. It's similar to uh, just feeding with an air compressor because you're just drawing in atmosphere through the leaks in the system because we have a negative pressure inside the pipe network, so it'll pull atmosphere in, which again is 21% oxygen, so it's the same amount of oxygen molecules. We're only worried outside the freezer environment or uh, any areas above 32 degrees because again, ice will impede the corrosion oxygen corrosion reaction. So it's a quick look at that slide. Um, for those of you, again, operating under FM, FM has specific instruction in the 2-0, the interim revision that happened in 2018 of this, or January of this year. Uh, they're going to tell you very simply that when you're using a vacuum type system that you need to use galvanized pipe or internally galvanized pipe unless you meet certain criteria, and that's what that 2496 is. You can use black seal, steel. But what we've got those bottom two arrows pointing to is you need to provide a single flow path within all parts of the sprinkler system. That's important because this vacuum technology, they're looking to approve basically a gridded wet, uh, I'm sorry, a gridded dryer pre-action system, which will be a huge technology change for us. Um, and I don't know, last time I talked to them, they, they were under the approval process, but it hadn't quite been approved yet. But that's one of the advantages they're looking to market with the vacuum type system. But again, if you're going to use black steel, you've got to use that single flow path as of right now. And you got to you need to avoid piping connections or methods that accumulate water. So you're going to need to cut groove your pipe. You're going to need to use a flush seal gasket. So thought important to point that out. Again, we kind of covered this, but that same example we looked at with the desiccant as far as a corrosion, we're looking at with a vacuum system. Suffice it to say, you have the same disparity between nitrogen and the vacuum system only because the vacuum system isn't reducing the amount of oxygen available inside the pipe network. So we're not reducing the corrosion rate. Wanted to share a couple case studies with you. We've, we've got a, a few of them out there right now, but the two we're sharing with you today are, we have a seven month study cold storage facility that was a negative 10 degrees F environment. It was a single pre-action system. The supervisory gas uh, was or for the systems were provided by uh, single interlock is what that bullet point is supposed to say. Supervisory gas provided by multiple dry air pack units. It was under a quarterly inspection and they were constantly finding ice plugs during their quarterly inspections with which led them to us. What we did for them was replace their dry air pack with a nitrogen generator and their subsequent two quarterly inspections, they found zero ice or frost accumulation. So for them, it was an excellent solution. It was an immediate payoff and immediate result that they could observe. The second case study we have to share with you has been running for um, a little over two years now. It's a much larger environment. We're talking about a million square foot facility. 
Uh, they had eight dry air pack units installed. They were under an annual inspection program. They were finding ice plugs consistently on their annual inspection. Uh, so what we did for them, they also, they believed that the, the reason they were finding or getting subpar performance was just because they weren't keeping, they could not keep up with the dry air pack maintenance. Uh, they felt it was cumbersome and costly. And so what we did for them is we took half of their facility and, and replaced their dry air packs with nitrogen generators. And for the next, the, the past two annual inspections that they've done post putting the nitrogen in on the systems that have had the nitrogen, they have had zero ice accumulation, zero frost accumulation. So again, it was a great fit, showed immediate results, but the, importantly in this case study, it showed sustainable results with nitrogen over a regenerative desiccant dryer. So right now, what we want to show you, which uh, part of my slide's missing here, but quick recap between dry air pack and nitrogen generator. It's the dew point of gas we can achieve is much lower with a nitrogen generator. The number of systems we can serve is much higher with the nitrogen generator, which is going to reduce your operation, installation, and maintenance costs. And then the maintenance breaking into the maintenance of itself. The nitrogen generator is a much simpler maintenance program. Um, for those of you that are operators or servicing the, the dry air packs or any regenerative desiccant dryer, highly recommend if you're not on a service program, maintenance service program, that you get your people on that immediately because it makes a big difference in the operation of these systems. Oh. Moving to the vacuum system, what we want to show again, just a quick recap, is you're going to have one cabinet per system, so one vacuum system for dryer pre-action system. Again, where the generators, we can go up to 22 systems per generator. Uh, vacuum, we're likely to prevent your ice accumulation. You're going to have the same O2 content, oxygen content as atmosphere. You're going to make sh need to make sure you have your listed sprinklers. Um, if you're in a retrofit application, it will involve replacing all your of your sprinklers. And we need to keep our eye out for the maintenance procedures. That's something we'll continue to try to delve into. Again, nitrogen, we recapped already, but it's it's much more sustainable, much more scalable solution. With that, I know we took a little bit longer than we wanted to, had a few more hiccups than we wanted to, but we appreciate your patience. We appreciate you joining us today. Hopefully we've answered some questions and, and pointed you to some new information that's going to be useful for you either as you operate your facilities or as you, as you work with your client base um, for your contractors out there. My contact information is on the screen right now. I encourage you to reach out with any questions. I'm going to check our questions right now and see if we have any out there. Um, let's see, what do we have here? All right. All right, so the right side of the slide was cut off. Okay, so we kind of addressed that. We'll, we can send out the slide deck in PDF format. So of those of you who missed some of it, um, we want to make sure that you get the full full effect. Slides available for download. We will do that. PDF presentation available. Absolutely. Single airline feed on the N2. Thank you, Travis, for pointing that out. NFPA 13 does tell you when we we're talking about those dual air feeds that route through the cold storage area. If you're using nitrogen as your supervisory gas, you don't need to do both of them. You can go to a single air feed. So great question, Travis. Thanks for pointing that out. So with that, it looks like that's those are all the questions we have. If you think of a question, please send it to us. Uh, as questions come in as a result of this webinar, we will make those available to the attendees uh, so that everyone's getting the same information. But again, thank you for your time, and we appreciate you. Reach out to us if you have anything else that you want us to talk about. Have a great day.